Overcoming healthcare disparities in the United States has been a long-time challenge. In this episode of the ASN Kidney News Podcast, ASN Executive Vice President Todd Ibrahim and ASN Past President Dr. Jonathan Himmelfarb speak with Dr. Janka Bull, the FDA's Assistant Commissioner of the Office of Minority Health, and Dr. Patrick Archdeacon, a medical officer at the FDA in the Office of Medical Policy, who is also co-chair of the Kidney Health Initiative, about ways to increase diversity in medical research and clinical trials. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to have today's conversation. We really want to try to understand how diversity affects clinical trials, as well as recognize ways or mechanisms to increase diversity in trials. So, Dr. Bull, why is diversity in research and in clinical trials so important? Thank you for your question. What we know is that addressing diversity, addressing the needs of demographic subgroups who may have disparate impact, may be disproportionately impacted in terms of disease prevalence, may have other disease confounders, comorbidities, um, that it's absolutely critical that we give careful thought to who are the patients in need, that we have a policy document that states that our clinical database should reflect the likely patient who will use the product once it's approved. So giving careful thought to how a product is going to be impactful if you're dealing with a population where, for example, in kidney disease, where it's often preceded by a pre-existing history of diabetes or hypertension as leading causes of kidney failure among African Americans. Um, are those patients adequately reflected in the trial so that when a product, be it a dialysis machine or drugs, ranging from drugs to devices, have it been adequately characterized for safe and effective use in the clinical context that they will be used. So I think awareness of who the patients are. We know that African Americans, for example, account for about 13% of the U.S. population, but they account for about 32% of people with kidney failure in the United States. So those kinds of factors are absolutely critical in terms of looking at patient characteristics and that they are adequately reflected in the clinical trials so that the healthcare provider and the patient at the end of the development process can have confidence that the benefit that they will hopefully experience as well as what risk or safety concerns are potentially present have been adequately characterized to ensure safe and effective use. So what are some of the barriers to having minorities participate in clinical trials, particularly African Americans? Well, we know historically there's the context of historic tragedies such as Tuskegee that contextually can create some reluctance to be in research. What we know now, though, is that when solid awareness is made of the kinds of protections that exist now, ranging from informed consent, institutional review boards, and also the greater altruistic piece of the need to know how a product performs in a patient like that patient, such as for a minority patient, are certainly overriding concerns, but also mitigating uh, factors that can help in terms of bending the needle to encourage and engender greater participation. What we also know is that the way we have historically done trials and from the ASN's efforts in increasing the numbers of investigators is that you have to go where the patients are and you need healthcare providers as well as clinical researchers who have access to those patients who are located in the areas where those patients who need care are. So I think the barriers, I think some are perhaps a bit structural that how we have historically done clinical research in the United States has not necessarily optimized access to minority patients, but there's another side to that in terms of developing a cadre of researchers that are serving those communities, addressing the historical reluctance of patients to be in research, be it from the history of tragedy and clinical research not being done ethically to just a reluctance to being a guinea pig and raising awareness of how important it is if they want to have adequate assurance that products have been studied in patients like them or their family members, that participation in clinical trials is absolutely essential to ensuring the best outcomes in their care. So before we move forward on barriers, I'm just curious, Dr. Himmelfarb, if you have anything you'd like to add to Dr. Bull's summary. 
I would congratulate the FDA for its efforts, and this is something I think we are increasingly paying attention to in clinical and translational research uh, in kidney diseases. Some examples, the, um, some of the major NIH-funded dialysis trials have actually overrepresented underrepresented minorities as participants in the trials. The HEMO study had more than 50% of the participating subjects were African Americans. So in some areas, we've done a very good job. In other areas, uh, not so well. And I think you point out some very important aspects of this. And, the, and one very important aspect is having investigators be members of the communities where patients are found. If we don't have that relationship, then we probably won't be enrolling underrepresented minorities in clinical trials in the way that we should be. So uh, I really applaud your thinking from the FDA standpoint about how critical this is. So, Dr. Bull, are there other examples of how the FDA is helping to overcome the barriers that you mentioned? Certainly. You may be aware that our commissioner, Commissioner Robert Caleb, has declared 2016 as the year of clinical trial diversity. I would also like to highlight that clinical trial inclusion has come to the attention of Congress under legislation passed in 2012, uh, what is known as the FDA Safety and Innovation Act included a Section 907 that required FDA to develop a report addressing the extent to which demographic subgroups, uh, women, minority groups, the elderly, uh, were included in clinical trials submitted to the agencies for approval for medical products across drugs, biologics, and devices. The legislation also required us to review our existing regulations and guidance documents and the adequacy to which they supported inclusion. And finally, the legislation required us to develop an action plan based on the findings of the report and the review of our guidances, as well as to engage stakeholders for feedback. So the report issued in August of 2013. We convened stakeholder meetings during that time following the issuance of the report to get feedback. And in August of 2014, we were legislatively mandated to issue an action plan based on the deficiencies identified in the report as well as input from stakeholders. So the action plan identifies three priorities. First, to improve the quality of data submitted to FDA in applications. Uh, what we found was that we had a number of instances where data was unevenly reported, not well identified, and so inclusion and analyses just couldn't be done. So we saw an opportunity to drive improvements in that area. Um, the second area of priority was to increase awareness of clinical trial among stakeholders and to do what we could from where we are to encourage industry as well as consumers. We are a consumer-focused agency in addition to being a regulatory agency. And then the final element was transparency so that the public has a greater awareness ranging from consumers to the, the healthcare community of the data that we review and that we base our decisions on. So those three elements, we convened a meeting uh, last February to review our progress. And where we are now is that we have a very robust site called the Drug Snapshot that is led by our Center for Drug Evaluation and Research that has throughout, uh, they, this was piloted in the fall of 2014, and all new molecular entities, new novel drugs in 2015 had drug snapshots. And this basically creates very accessible data that in simplified format to address inclusion. And so from a transparency standpoint, we are doing a much more effective job of shining a light on the data we review. In terms of quality, we have undertaken a review of our guidance documents so that we can provide greater clarity on how data should be collected under current standards because our standards have to reflect the Office of Management and Budgets directives. Uh, and so we're looking to clarify data collection procedures and to harmonize those in a more efficient way with the criteria that are used by NIH. So that's another step that we're doing. And we now have advanced education within FDA speaker series. I've mentioned some of the public meetings that we have convened. Uh, we would certainly welcome the opportunity in the future to work with ASN on convening seminars and dialogue and certainly the work that 
Patrick is involved in on the kidney initiative. We certainly appreciate the work that's been done addressing health disparities under that initiative. So uh, we're both broad stroke as well as disease area specific in terms of where the greatest needs are because the ultimate goal is that we are doing everything that we can in fulfilling our role in public health to ensure better health outcomes for all Americans. But taking into account the fact that we are all, you know, in terms of precision medicine, personalized medicine, that we're taking patient factors and some of those that, that actually do sometimes coalesce in terms of groups, that those items are taken into account with greater care. Well, thank you. As Dr. Himmelfarb said at the beginning of the discussion, ASN is fully committed to helping you as you accomplish your office's mission, and I think you've provided us a wonderful entree into the relationship between ASN and the FDA. And, and I would like to give Dr. Archdeacon an opportunity to talk a little bit about the many public-private partnerships that FDA has developed over the last few years, and then focus specifically on the Kidney Health Initiative. So, Dr. Archdeacon, do you mind just sort of walking us through some of the partnerships and then ending with the Kidney Health Initiative? Sure. Well, I'll focus on two that are based out of my office, Office of Medical Policy. So those include the Clinical Trial Transformation Initiative and also, as you were mentioning, the Kidney Health Initiative. I'll just say as an aside, another office, Office of Translational Sciences, is home to something called our Critical Path Initiative which goes back more than a decade. The Critical Path Initiative is an umbrella under which there are many, many uh, public-private partnerships, including things like CDISC, where they develop data standards, as well as some disease-specific partnerships. I'm less involved with those, so it's probably less valuable for me to spend time discussing those. But I certainly am aware that they're a big asset for us. The ones that I I think I'll, I'll choose to focus on for this podcast are the Kidney Health Initiative and the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative. So the Kidney Health Initiative was started in 2012 when American Society of Nephrology came to FDA looking for ways that uh, the nephrology community could have a greater voice. And essentially, we came with this partnership. I'll take a moment just to give you the mission statement, which is to advance scientific understanding of the kidney health and patient safety implications of new and existing medical products and to foster development of therapies for diseases that affect the kidney by creating a collaborative environment in which FDA and the greater nephrology community can interact to optimize evaluation of drugs, devices, biologics, and food products. So that's a a pretty ambitious mission. Um, But I think in the three years that we've been fully functional, we started to make some significant progress. The mechanism through which we do this are, are largely projects And the projects come to us through the ideas submitted to us by our member organizations, of which we have more than 75 now. So essentially, these ideas come in, and we consider them based on a few criteria, their impact, their feasibility to conduct, and and their compatibility with our resources. Um, And usually, our, our number one resource is the sweat equity of our member organizations. So we now have a portfolio of more than a dozen projects, several of which have started to complete. We remain open to, you know, new projects uh, multiple times a year. We'll open what we call our project portal. And certainly if there are people listening to this podcast who have compelling ideas about specific projects that we could do to improve this important problem, we'd love to hear them. We do ask that our submissions come to us through member organizations, but I suspect that many people who are listening to this podcast mostly collaborated with one of our 75 member organizations. And if there is any event that someone were not, I suspect that we could still find a way to uh, work with them through one of our member organizations to develop their idea. So, Dr. Archdeacon, you mentioned more than a dozen projects. Can you describe projects that will link to the mission of the Office of Minority Health and efforts to increase diversity in clinical trials? Yeah. So, we would love for the process I was describing to consider projects specifically designed to increase minority enrollment in trials. Uh, to, to date, we, we don't have such a project. But what we do have is, I think, a lot of projects because they generally are improving conduct of clinical trials, speak to some of the issues that that Dr. Bull was mentioning about our failure to necessarily always have trials that adequately reflect the patient population. So one that I'm particularly excited about is uh, our pragmatic trials in the setting of dialysis center project. So that is something that's been led by Laura Denver, a a nephrologist at the University of Pennsylvania. The, The idea is if we could incorporate clinical trials into patient care, 
that that would be really the best setting to study currently available medical products and make sure that we're optimizing their use. One of the nice attractive parts about doing that type of pragmatic trial is is that the patient population that you will recruit will much more accurately reflect the American patients who have end-stage renal disease. A second project that, you know, I think is important to uh, people affected with kidney disease, particularly some of the uh, minority populations who are disproportionately affected with kidney disease, is uh, our lupus nephritis project. So their kidney health initiative is helping FDA gather and analyze data that would inform um, appropriate clinical trial design in lupus nephritis, particular type of lupus affecting the kidney. Lupus nephritis disproportionately affects black women. FDA has been very interested for a number of years in figuring out how to best design clinical trials in this area, but has not been able to meet its goal of putting out guidance to industry in this area because of a a lack of data to support some conclusions. So the efforts of Kidney Health Initiative through this project are really exciting uh, and helping us move forward this particular therapeutic area. So, Dr. Bull, before we sort of move forward off of this topic, I'm just curious, the success of both of these projects really depends on a conversation between the physician and his or her patient, encouraging them to participate in clinical trials. What strategies would you recommend to facilitate that discussion? Well, it takes a sheer commitment, and I think it's also commitment that is grounded in trust because both the healthcare provider, the, the investigator, and the patient have to have assurances from the developer that there is the potential of benefit that's fundamental to the research process that risk does not outweigh benefit. And I think particularly for the areas that Patrick has highlighted, these are areas of critical unmet need. And so if we're going to advance new therapies so that we are able to advance understanding of disease process, uh, achieve a better understanding of what products work in which patients, we've got to have those patients included in the trials. So I would say there's an overarching imperative that really is grounded in that conversation between the investigator and the patient that if we're going to really strive to achieve better clinical outcomes, participation in research, and with the understanding that it may not benefit that individual patient, but if we're going to move science forward, it's going to take heroes like those patients, heroes and heroines, who are willing to step forward and for what risk is entailed in being a research participant, but it's absolutely essential if we're going to advance the science of clinical care. Uh, This is is tremendous to hear about all of the efforts that particularly have happened through the Kidney Health Initiative to advance therapies for people living with kidney disease. And we know that by definition, since underrepresented minorities are disproportionately included in that population, new therapies will sort of raise all boats if we can develop safe and effective therapies. My question would be, from the ASN standpoint, what can we be doing that could help as far as getting the word out about the importance of making sure that underrepresented minorities have the opportunity to participate in this kind of research that really does have the potential to remove barriers to more safe and effective treatments than we have available today? Yeah, I think maybe before I try to tackle that, that, you know, intersection to see if there's something that we can be doing together. I think my immediate reaction is simply that physicians have to learn to ask the question of all of their patients about whether or not they're interested in participating in a clinical trial. So I, I in general, uh, operate in this area of clinical trial enterprise efficiency. And one thing that's sort of pointed out to me is that nephrology seems to have a different culture than some other areas of internal medicine, like perhaps cardiology or oncology, where more often than not, when patients present to their physician for the first time, they may be offered to be in a clinical trial. And I think in nephrology, for a myriad of reasons, the culture is not set up where the the patients are reflexively offered that. I think it's not clear to me that minority patients are even less likely to be offered, although we we don't have data on that. But I think because nephrology is this area of internal medicine where we know there are many, many more minority patients proportionally than these other areas, it certainly magnifies the problem that nephrology has in general about not being a discipline that I think has a, a culture of doing randomized clinical trials. 
Well, Dr. Archdeacon, I would agree with that, and I think this is something we can work on. Uh, another component to our new strategic plan is that we are encouraging every kidney health professional in the world to contribute to the ASN, and that involves expanding our membership to really include the entire interprofessional kidney health care team. So that's not just physicians and not just scientists but also doctors of pharmacy, pharmacists, advanced practice providers, nurses, dietitians, and social workers, many of whom are very intimately involved with our patient population. And there may be ways that we can help contribute to clinical trial success by really engaging the entire healthcare team and, as you say, changing the culture of nephrology and kidney disease care in a way that will really support the research mission of bringing new therapies to our patients. As I think a little bit about the opportunities for how ASN might help FDA, and since I'm wearing sort of the KHI hat here, this may be a KHI-centric response. As I sort of alluded to earlier, our process for selecting projects really depends a lot on the grassroots efforts of our stakeholders. We we essentially are sourcing that activity out to our member organizations. And the reason for that is we at FDA can try to inject projects into KHI, but if there's not really a passion for doing the work, it's hard for us to rely on the sweat equity of the member organizations to uh, complete the project. So I think it would be very interesting to us if uh, American Society of Nephrology was able to work with some of its particular members or, or perhaps member organizations to develop uh, ideas for submission to kidney health initiatives to make use of this platform. I think certainly there would be immediate support for that type of work at, at FDA because there's, there's no doubt about its importance. Uh, we're simply just looking, I think, for an opportunity for a well-thought-out idea that we can put our weight behind. So for those of you who are interested in more information about the Kidney Health Initiative, it's available on ASN's website uh, under Kidney Health Initiative. If you'd like to learn more about the new ASN strategic plan, that's also available on the ASN website under About ASN. And Dr. Bull, if any of our listeners are interested in more information about clinical trial diversity, where can they go? It's easy. They can go to FDA.gov, our website, and under For Consumers, go to the Office of Minority Health or Minority Populations and hit that link, and you'll be right there with a wealth of information on clinical trial participation. So I encourage everyone who's listening to visit those three sites and learn more, and please let each of us know if if you'd like some follow-up information or if you have any questions. Dr. Bull, Dr. Archdeacon, and Dr. Himmelfarb, thank you for participating in today's discussion. I really appreciate everyone taking the time. Thank you. My pleasure. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology, All Rights Reserved. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any agency of the U.S. government. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. This podcast should not be used in a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified health care provider if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug, changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast of the American Society of Nephrology.